did want to recap just real quickly because I'm going to jump back into the series called Living the Mission. Why don't you turn to somebody next to you and say, we're living the mission. The emphasis is on the word living. We're living the mission. We're not just learning the mission. We're not just studying the mission. We're living it. And in the first message, Pastor Joe talked about the idea of the movement, that in order to be in mission, we had to move. Mission and movement go together. And he talked about how we could be up on the mountain with Jesus. But mission requires us to come down the mountain and enter into the brokenness of humanity. He said that discipleship is really, you can't be a disciple unless you're also making disciples. So you'll notice as Grace Fellowship continues to refine our vision statement, we don't call it discipleship. We call it discipling. Our spell checkers don't like that, but that's a good word because it says we're not just learning, we're doing disciple. The second message, Pastor Joe took time to sort of lead us to the place where most of us are at. We get caught. We're caught between the mission and our own doubt. We're caught between our distractions of life, our social media, whatever it is, we're, we're, we're caught between that and the fact that we want to move in the mission. And we have our own doubts. And one of the things he cautioned us against is that if we're living the mission, our metric, our way of measuring, maybe shouldn't only be attendance in this building, right? The metric of attendance is way too easy <laughs> to say you're living the mission or not living the mission because if you're small, you can get discouraged and if you're big, you can get fooled. And so discipling actually means that attendance at the building is only part of the story because each one of you are discipling or being discipled probably outside of this building. And I liked what he said, being one of the old guys here. He said, if you're not dead, you're not done with the mission. So if you're not dead, you're not done. So today... I'm going to unpack the scripture from Matthew 28 that we call the Great Commission. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that Christianity without discipleship is Christianity without Christ. Now, too often we might call the Great Commission, the Great Omission. Because the church isn't always doing so good on this commission. For example, look at this graphic from a study done by Lifeway Ministries, where they ask, has anyone ever shared with you on any of the following? How a person becomes a Christian, the benefits of becoming a Christian, the benefits of participating in a local church, or none of these. 29% of the people said, a Christian has never shared with me how a person becomes a Christian. And 40% said, a Christian has never shared with me any of these things. And then I found this from our friend George Barna and the Barna Institute, where they do surveys. And this kind of looks at how people are handling witnessing and faith sharing generationally. And it's a busy chart. And if you want it, 
personally, I'll be sure you get it in your email. But what I want you to look at is the top line says, part of my faith means being a witness about Jesus. And regardless of what generation you are, it's in the high 90s. And then you go to the next one. The best thing that could ever happen to someone is for them to come to know Jesus. How many of you believe that? And that's in the high 90s, or mid-90s at least. But then I want you to drop down with, it is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hopes that they will one day share the same faith. It's wrong to share your faith. And 47% of millennials say that it's wrong, it's actually wrong to share your faith. That's scary. But maybe that's why we're not seeing the faith being shared. The world actually has more professing Christians, but shockingly few fired up disciples, Christians who have chosen to spend their lives learning how to follow Jesus. That's what I want you to think of as a disciple, a Christian who is spending their life learning how to follow Jesus. Now, Jesus gave this great commission. He said, go and make disciples. And we're going to look at that in some depth in the next few minutes. But it's like your parents told you to clean your room. Clean your room, they said. And they have authority. They own the home. You are their child. You, they are your parents. And they say, clean your room. And you wash the dishes. You do your homework. You clean the garage. You call your grandma. You do your Bible study. You walk an old lady across the street. You learn the latest praise song. And your parents say, what did I ask you to do? <laughs> Clean your room. And you say, but mom, dad, I did all these other things. And your parents say, but I told you to clean your room. Let's dive into today's scripture. From Matthew 28, we'll start at verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. How many of you are familiar with that passage? You've ever heard it before? We've all heard it. Let's pray. Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, come now. Use my words, indwell our hearts, open our minds, Challenge us to live the mission for your honor and glory, and it's in your name we pray.
So I want you to look at this scripture a little bit more closely. One of the first things we see is some doubted. Some doubted. Now, you got to remember, these are the disciples who hung out with Jesus and then he died. And then they start hearing that he's alive. And now he shows up. <laughs> would you doubt? Maybe you would doubt. I think I might have some doubt. Some doubted. But it didn't stop Jesus from giving them the commission, even though they doubted. Earlier, in Matthew 16, uh, they had said, well, we know who you are. You're the Messiah. You're the Christ. But now, <laughs> he's in front of them as the risen Lord, and it's not just a truth statement anymore. It's like, oh my goodness, you, you, you are. You are the Messiah. You are Lord. And then I want you to look at the, we might say, superlatives or the, or the words that are there that just talk about all. So what do you see in verse 18? He says, all authority. All authority is given to me. In verse 19, we see, go to all the nations. And then in verse 20, we see everything. Uh, that he has commanded. And then as he ends verse 20, he says, I'll be with you. How long? Always. 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 How long is always? It's always. <laughs> it's a long, long time. So let's take a look at the first statement and pull apart authority a little bit. Jesus has authority. Remember early on, uh, sometimes people would say, wow, he teaches with such authority. He had authority over unclean spirits. When he sent the disciples out, he gave them authority. Someone who has power can give authority. That's how policemen work. They have governmental power and they have authority. You have authority in your household. Jesus has authority. Now that he is the resurrected Lord, he has authority. He is the king of the universe. He has conquered sin and conquered death, and he has risen glorious. He's the supreme commander, and he has the authority to command the disciples. And you know what? If you've trusted Jesus, he has authority over you. He has authority over me. Jesus has been given all authority, so he doesn't send us out as disciples like sheep to the slaughter. <laughs> he, he sends us out as people who go with what? His, stay with me now, his authority. In Corinthians, Paul calls us his ambassadors. So he has authority. So the first part of the scripture, he has authority. Then he says, go. Therefore, go. Whenever we see therefore in the scriptures, what is it therefore, as we ask, right? Therefore, go. Now, we may think of go as go, but what it really means is as you are going. As you are going. As you go to school. As you go to work. As you walk in your neighborhood. As you visit with someone at Walmart or the bakery, as you stand at a soccer game with your kids or grandkids, as you go, make disciples. As you go. 
But it also means go. And this is always a great scripture that they use to challenge us to, for missionaries to go around the world. And it does mean that also. It means go to all nations. 3.2 billion people, that's B, billion with a B, will be born, live, and die without ever knowing Jesus. Many without even hearing or having a Bible. And 7,300 languages exist in the world that we know of. And over a thousand of them still need a Bible translation that they could read. Go. And maybe some of you here this morning, I don't know, maybe there's a young person, maybe there's an old person that's retired. God will say, go. Take a world assignment on. Take an assignment in your neighborhood. Take an assignment somewhere, but go and as you are going. So it is both local and global go. There is no disciple making without going. We have to leave our Jesus bubble <laughs> and go as we are going. And we take the proclamation to family and people in our country, but we also take it to the world. What Jesus means when he says all nations, he means there are no exceptions, no borders, no boundaries to his disciple-making mission. Charles Stanley says, true believers do not just receive grace, they build their life around sharing it with others. Go. What's the next part of the commission? Make. Make. Make a disciple. What do you think of when, it, when you say make? What does it take to make? What? Ingredients, okay? What else? We do this at Grace. If you're visiting, we ask people to sort of chime in, help the poor pastor out. Materials, okay. Ingredients, materials. What else do you need to make? Time, okay. You know, tools. Desire. Yeah, you got to say, hey, I want to do this instead of this. Yeah. Anything else? Action. <laughs> you got to do something. All right. So a disciple is not just a church attender. A disciple is not just a rule follower. It's someone who makes disciples. And a disciple, what is a disciple? I said it's someone who's trusted in and is willing to give their whole life to follow and learn from Jesus. But the other important part to understand disciple is it isn't a program. It isn't, it isn't like learning in a classroom. It's a commitment to a person. When you were a disciple in the early days, you followed in the footsteps of your rabbi. Your rabbi was your leader, and you followed him. And you were committed to him. Socrates said, the story is told that a disciple came to Socrates and wanted to be one of his disciples. And he took him to the water and he put his 
head under the water and held it there for several seconds, several more seconds, bubbles started to appear, and several more seconds he held him under the water, and then finally, (sighs) and Socrates said, when you want to be my disciple, as much as you just wanted to breathe, you can be my disciple. Do we understand what it means to be a disciple? And how do we make? The verse says we do two things. We baptize and we teach. We talked about ingredients. We talked about a plan. We talked about tools. We talked about what does it take to make? What Jesus says, it takes two things. It takes baptism and teaching. Baptism is when someone comes to the place of trust in Jesus and they're willing to make that public and then they become Baptized. It doesn't make them a believer, but it's the sign of a believer. Jesus says, you need to baptize. That's a one-time thing. It happens one time in a life. And Jesus says, do that. But then he says, teaching them everything. <laughs> Everything I've taught you. Three years he was with those disciples that he's talking with. As their friends, as, the, as, as walking along the road, as teaching them. So baptism is a one-time event. Teaching is a lifelong journey. Teaching is a lifelong journey. That's why better metric for the church rather than attendance is number of baptisms. Both child baptisms and adult baptisms. Baptisms are a better metric because they indicate that someone is willing to enter into the process of discipleship. Another metric might be people who are discipling someone And another one might be people who are being discipled. Church Renewal Team met yesterday morning, and we talked about this idea of a goal. What would it be like if everyone at Grace Fellowship was being discipled and was learning how to make disciples and was making disciples. What would it be like? And then this teach idea, it's not like me up here pontificating. It's not like you going to a class. It's modeling. The kind of teaching that they're talking about is more watch and learn than sit and listen. You see, you don't become a disciple in this setting. I hate to tell you, it's valuable. It should be encouraging. It should give you information. But guess what? Sitting here on a Sunday morning for 30 minutes or an hour or even two hours, God forbid, um, won't make you a disciple. Discipleship takes place in the course of relationship. Discipleship requires one-on-one, two-on-one, three-on-one. You look at how Jesus did it. Look at that motley crew of people (laughs) that he became friends with. And just look around and see the motley crew that God has put here at Grace Fellowship. But Discipleship happens life-on-life, one-on-one. Discipleship 
happens in the context of friendship. And many shy away from discipleship because guess what? It's messy. Real discipleship is messy. It's one step forward, two steps back. It's like, what does this scripture mean anyway? It's messy and it takes time, someone over here said. And it takes patience and wisdom. And you will learn more by teaching and and discipling someone than you will ever learn coming to a million sermons in this building. Cheryl and I had the opportunity to go down to a church in Florida. It's called Sunlight Community Church. It's one of the largest CRC churches in the country. They started with a small group, probably smaller than we are this morning. And they started a discipleship ministry. And they make sure as much as possible that everyone understands the gospel. And they make sure everyone is being discipled and is learning how to disciple others. Sunlight Church in Port St. Lucie, Florida, over time has grown into six church campuses in five schools. We have a saying that if you build the church, you will rarely get disciples. But if you build disciples, you will always get the church. Now Jesus gives, at the end of this passage, this wonderful promise. He makes a beautiful promise of his presence. What does he say? I will, help me out, be with you always. I will be with you. Part of what he's saying is, I know this is going to be hard. I know it's going to get messy. I know it's going to take time. I I just know it, but I will be with you. And who is that? The risen Christ. The one who went to the cross for you and I. The one who conquered sin and death. The one who is alive and present. I will be with you. One of the amazing things I learned as I was preparing is at the very beginning of Matthew, we have a word called Emmanuel. It says, and he will be called Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean, church? God with us. So here we've got Matthew, the whole book, starting out with God with us and ending with what? God with us. Bookends the whole story. In fact, one commentator said the resurrection ends with a commission to his disciples in the light of the cross, the empty tomb, and the exaltation of the risen Lord. The final chapter is being written in you and me as we live the mission. Could it be? Could it be? that Jesus' mission is still being written by you and by me. And he promises that he will be with us. So let me give you a few practical ideas and I'll close. How do we live the mission? Thank you for all this inspiration. Thank you for all this truth. But how do we do it? Well, here's one thing. Build self-discipline. Build your own self-discipline. The word disciple comes from the same root word that we get discipline. 
John Maxwell says, motivation will get you going, but it's discipline that will get you growing. So you don't have to be perfect, but ask yourself this morning, do I see signs of regular spiritual growth and increased discipline evident in my life? From this point in time to this point in time, do I see spiritual growth? Number two, dig into God's word. God's word is nourishment for the soul. It is the curriculum for discipleship. There are so many discipleship programs out there, but you know one of the best ways to do it is to meet one-on-one with somebody and say, hey, how's your life going? And share and sit down and then pick a passage of scripture and just talk about it together and then just pray and say, How can we apply this to our lives in the weeks and months ahead? We need the full counsel of God's word to build strong disciples. How are you getting regularly into God's word? Some of you, some of you uh, still do Pastor Pete's version when he does a plan, right? So Pastor Pete, if you're familiar with version, there's a plan almost every week. I have a great app I use called Dwell. I don't know if you ever heard of it, but it allows me to listen to scripture and reflect every single day. And it reminds me when I forget, which I do. We have the today uh, devotionals in the back. There are Bible in a year plans, whatever, but get into regular times of prayer, and reading God's word. Here's another thing that's practical. Make sure you're a disciple. Good friend of mine says, if it don't work at home, don't export it. Right? (laughs) So the idea is, are you a living testimony to Jesus? Is his love and light shining in everything you say and do? And learn to become a witness to the gospel in word and deed. I see people, myself included, get this one wacky. Because how many of you have ever heard Mother Teresa preach a sermon to everybody you see, use words if necessary? Right? You ever heard that? And that's great. Live a wholesome Christian, godly life at your work, at your school. It's a beautiful thing, but you know what? It also takes your words. And some people can't shut up. And then, I, then people say, well, I see how you, how you talk, but I also see how you live and it don't work for me, right? Be a disciple in both word and deed. Here's another thing we can do. Identify your one. Sometimes when we think about discipleship, holy cow, how do I do that? It's a long program. What do I do? I don't know how to study the Bible. Just identify your one. Ask God to help you find the one, the one person, the one person, the one person that you can befriend, pray for, and then make a friendship and create a discipling friendship. Remember, discipling happens in relationship. Are you engaged one-on-one or in a small group? Are you allowing your life to be interwoven with Jesus and others like the lives of the disciples? Here's one of my favorite questions for myself and maybe for you. Do you have a Paul and a Timothy in your life? You know what I mean by that? Do you have a mentor and a mentee? Do you have someone more spiritually mature than you? 
and someone less mature than you in your life? Do you have someone? And some of us will say, well, there's nobody here that's more mature than me, so I don't know where to find my Paul. Well, then go to the radio or go to find someone. One of my mentors, we saw a quote earlier, was Charles Stanley. I used to listen to Charles Stanley as I drove on the road. He mentored me. He was far more mature. There are many others. But do you have a Paul? And even more importantly, do you have a Timothy in your life? And here's the challenge that I'd like to leave with you. Maybe God is calling you to serve as a missionary. Maybe the need is great and you could fill it. The need here in Pella, the need in Southeast Iowa is great, but also around the world. And we have a responsibility as a church to fulfill the Great Commission by sending people. It thrills me that at one of our last council meetings, we talked about Amos and Eli. We talked about people who had been part of grace and been baptized and been taught and then have gone on. We support the Spalinks in Japan. We support the merits in Turkey through your financial giving. But we can and should do even more. And there might be. I'm actually even believing there is someone here that God right now is tugging on your heart. I want you to be one of the ones who go. Go outside. Go into full-time Christian service. Somewhere in the unreached world. So I'd like to conclude. And all the people clap. (laughs) I'm thinking of a young girl that was part of Grace Fellowship for a while. She grew up with both emotional and sexual abuse. She participated in our church. She left our church. She left the influence of this community. But somehow, through the connection of this church, she got the book More Than a Carpenter. And she started reading it. And now she's being discipled by a few people from our church. And she's attending a church where she lives. And she's asking deep questions about faith and the Bible and is in process of becoming a a disciple. You helped create that life. Some of you know exactly who I'm talking about. I'm keeping some things confidential for a reason. And the very best part is she's already started sharing her faith with others. And if I went around the room, I'm sure there are many others that you can talk about that I discipled, I know this person I shared this book, I shared my faith, and now they're walking with the Lord. I want to close with Matthew 24, 14. Same book, same author. Matthew says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then what? The end will come. Do you realize the end of the world, the consummation of God's plan is partly on our shoulders? Because until we share our faith, 
until it's preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. He's holding off the end. He's holding back evil. It is his will that none should perish. And I believe he says to you and I this morning, live the mission, Grace Fellowship. Live the mission. Become part of the generation that brings this gospel of the kingdom to the whole world. I found this paraphrase of the Great Commission. The whole world is mine, and I invite you to engage in it. As you are going, invite people to learn more about me. As you go to school this week, as you Go to work, to the gym, to visit your friends, to pay your taxes. Let your walk with me be so natural and part of your everyday speech that people feel free to talk openly about faith and life. Let your baptismal identity be so real that it splashes on everyone around you. I love that phrase. Flood the world with the love of the triune God. Show people how to obey my teaching and let the love of God be the rule of your life. And remember, I'm always with you as we walk this messy life together. Live the mission. Let's pray. Gracious God, we look at the Great Commission and we have all kinds of ways of looking at it, but we absorb it afresh this morning as a commandment. I ask you, Lord, to take these words and use them however you see fit to help each of us live the mission more fully. Help us, each of us, to be willing to be discipled and to become a discipler. And let us rest in the comfort that you will always be with us.